All right. Good morning. Good morning. Go ahead and have a seat if you do that. Let's take our Bibles. Open, please, to Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. The title of our message is Defeating the Enemy. We're getting back to our study of Revelation. Um, back from our trip, uh, we took a large group of people, and uh, man, we covered so much ground. We were in uh, Corinth, ancient Corinth. is absolutely amazing. It's just you know, the, the, the journeys of Paul and Corinth has come alive when you get there and you see the Acropolis, this, this upper uh, city. It's like, wow, that is really an amazing thing. And the Temple of Aphrodite was up there. Uh, Athens, just amazing, astounding, um, just to see. And then the islands uh, of Greece that he stopped upon. We were in uh, Israel for several days. What an amazing thing just to go to the lands of the Bible and see the stories just come alive before you. We took a boat onto the Sea of Galilee, which was awesome. Uh, took communion at the Garden Tomb. Uh, then we also then left, uh, we got on the island of Crete, where Paul spent quite a bit of time. Uh, he was also there just before uh, the shipwreck. If you remember, he was under arrest and uh, was on this ship. And they encountered this massive storm, and they shipwrecked on the island of Malta, which is just off of Italy. And uh, so I was teasing the group as we were getting closer to Malta. I said, you know, I, I've, I've arranged for, I've been praying for a storm. I mean, let's make this thing authentic, shall we? And when we got to Malta, there was a storm. I'm talking about lightning and thunder and the ship rocking back and forth, rocking back and forth. And... Okay, that's an exaggeration, but it was awesome. And uh, man, you go to Malta, and it's like you can see the whole scene of Paul unfolding. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a reef there. You can see the waves breaking over the reef. And uh, um, in fact, uh, archaeologists had looked at the account and decided, well, in that case, according to the description in the book of Acts, there ought to be four Roman anchors about 90 feet just off that reef. And in fact, divers found four Roman anchors just off that reef. And uh, we went to the Maritime Museum, and they've got one of the huge ones on display. And it's like, well, that is so amazing. The whole island is amazing. And in Rome, we were there for a couple of days. Absolutely impressive. Just impressive. But if you ask my granddaughter uh, the highlight of the trip, she would tell you it was when Grandpa got spit on by a llama. <clears throat> Wasn't the highlight for me, but it was for her. She thought it was so funny. And what had happened was this. We're on the island of Rhodes. Uh, Paul had stopped there. But we had a f kind of a free day. So um, we decided to rent a car, drive along the coast, down about an hour where there was an ancient uh, castle. I mean, just as you would imagine. There's an amazing castle on this big cliff. And afterwards, then we drove along the coast. And we found a place for a via to go swimming in the Mediterranean, which was cool. And we had a little extra time, and uh, we decided, hey, it says on this thing that there is like this butterfly farm. And we got some time, right? So let's go find it. Problem is, our phones were dead, and all we had was this rudimentary map and my rudimentary Greek. And I'm trying to read the, the road signs and this map all in Greek, you know, but we wind through the mountains, and, which was kind of a fun adventure. We finally found it, only to discover, no, the butterflies left in the middle of September. Like, it's, it's closed, right? So Avia then says, well, now we have some extra time. Let's stop at the ostrich farm. Like, okay, let's do that. So we go to the ostrich farm and you buy some food to feed them by hand and they give you some lettuce for the other animals. And so it was just a fun stop, right? And, and we do this and they've got a camel and we fed them some lettuce and, and Jordy's playing with his donkey. And then the next thing you know, up comes this llama. Well, the llama, I, appear, I think it had like a sinus problem of some kind. Because <laughs> he started, you know, like this and just unloaded on the donkey. I mean, yeah, exactly. Just unloaded on the donkey. And Jordy says, be careful. He's going to spit on you. I said, no, no, he just unloaded. <laughs> but he's got a sinus problem, I'm sure, because he started doing it again <laughs> like this. And then he turned to me and just blasted me <laughs> like all over my shirt. I, I know. Blasted me. It just stank, right? And so uh, Via and Jordy are just laughing, right? Just laughing. And then later, Via says, You know, there's a spiritual lesson here, Grandpa. 
<laughs> she says, you know, many people, like, they spit at God, but he still gives them the grace. I said, you know what, that's worth the price of the ticket right there. Have you? And uh, in fact, the suspect in question is right here. Does he not look like a, an attitude right there? All right. It's kind of funny, though, because I, I, I brought the car back, right, to the rental place, and the guy's right there when I drive in, and he looks at me, right? And he says, what happened to you? And I said, well, I got spit on by a llama. And he said, well, how did that happen? I said, well, I was at the ostrich farm. And he said, why are we at the ostrich farm? I said, well, because the butterfly farm was closed. Said, okay, now let's move on, shall we? Lord, thank you so much for your word that just encourages us and strengthens us and gives us an insight into the latter days. So Lord, help us to understand that these are insights that we need to have written upon our hearts. Show us these things now in Jesus' name, amen. So Revelation 12 is very important because it shows us the nature of spiritual warfare that is behind the events that are happening in the latter days, but we have to understand also that it's telling us that there is spiritual warfare behind the things that are happening in the world right now. I mean, you look at what's happening in the world. Are we not seeing the nations changing? Are we not seeing history unfolding? Are we not seeing a major shift in what's happening in the world right now? What we need to understand is that there is spiritual warfare behind these things. And in fact, it's important to recognize that spiritual warfare is all around us. In fact, if you have asked Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior, then you are in spiritual battle because you are a target. And that's what we're going to see in these verses. But you also can be victorious, right? We have, this, we have this view into heaven. John says that he, he looked and he saw this sea of glass like crystal. I love that picture. And in the center was this throne and he who sat upon it, of course, is the Almighty. And then there were the four living creatures just immediately around him. What an amazing description of them. And then the 24 elders sitting on 24 thrones, and then he says, I looked and the one who sat on the throne had in his hand a scroll that was sealed with seven seals. And I heard a loud voice saying, who is worthy to look into the book and to break the seven seals? But no one was found worthy. And so he, John responds by weeping. He's, he's crying at the fact that no one's found worthy. And one of the elders says to him, stop weeping for the lion from the tribe of Judah has overcome so as to break the seals and to look into the book. And so he says, I looked and I saw a lamb as though slain. And when he took the book from he who sat on the throne, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, they fell down before the lamb and they worshiped and they sang a new song. And he began to break the seals. And as he broke each of the seals, it released and set forth another aspect of the tribulation period, the wrath of God that was poured out on the world. And when he got to the seventh seal, when he, when he broke the seventh seal, he said there were seven angels having seven trumpets. And as each of the angels, as each of them sounded the trumpet, it released another aspect of God's wrath poured out. And that's what we've been studying uh, as we've been going through verse by verse on Wednesdays is the, the, the sounding of these trumpets and what has been released. It's nothing but astounding. But when he releases and sounds the seventh, or excuse me, the sixth, there's a pause, like an interlude. Before the seventh one is sounded, there is this interlude. And there we have these scenes unfolding before us. And Revelation 12 is the scene we're looking at today. Because it's, it's important to see that it is the, the revealing of spiritual warfare as we see the serpent of old, which is Satan, the accuser, devil. He's mighty in power, desiring to destroy, knowing that his time is short. But it's also about our spiritual victory. Our enemy is the defeated foe. And we are called to be overcomers. You do not have to be defeated. In fact, we are given everything that we need for spiritual victory. Let's read Revelation 12, beginning in verse 1. And a great sign appeared in heaven. There was a woman 
clothed with the sun, moon under her feet, and her head had a crown of 12 stars. Okay, who is this woman? And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and pain to give birth. Well, who is this child? There was another sign that appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. And on his heads were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven. Now, these are not literal stars, but the angelic realm he's referring to here when he calls them stars of heaven. And he threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might devour the child. Who is this child? And she gave, a, she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne, which gives us an insight. This is none other than the Messiah. This is Jesus Christ himself, who is that child, who is born to that woman, and that woman is Israel. Jesus was Jewish. He came from the Jewish nation, the Jewish people. And the woman, Israel, fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there she might be nourished for 1,260 days, which is three and a half years by the Jewish calendar. And there was war in heaven. And Michael, who we know to be one of the supreme and great and powerful angels, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels waged war, but they were not strong enough and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven that said, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren. And take note of that title of our enemy. The accuser of our brethren has been thrown down who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even to death. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. But notice verse 13, because it's very key. When the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman. He persecuted Israel, who gave birth to the male child. Now, these are very important verses, and I want us to go back over them, taking note particularly that he starts out with this description of war. There is a war in heaven. There's spiritual battle. There's spiritual warfare behind so many things. He gives us these two signs. There's this woman. This is Israel. She gives birth to a son. This is Jesus Christ. The second sign is this great red dragon who is a serpent of old. That is the devil or Satan. And these are the backdrop to the spiritual nature of the latter days. But also, he's giving us a view here into history. He's giving us the history as well as the future in this description, particularly of, of, of Satan. It's important to recognize that. And he's showing us this that Satan has been thrown down. He's giving us the history here. He's getting as well as the future. Uh, now, we know, of course, that Satan was, at one time, originally called Lucifer. Now, when, we've, when we hear the name Lucifer, we've, of course, uh, added to that, rightly so, the idea of a great evil, a terrible you know, viciousness to the name Lucifer. No one in their right mind would name their son Lucifer. But originally, it was a beautiful name. The originally, it was, it was majestic, beautiful, because he was the greatest and most, most beautiful and powerful. But his sin, he had the sin of wanting to be like God. In fact, it could be called the lie. So when you think of the lie, it's that, that desire to be like God, to be God's. 
But you look at the, the scriptures and you get these insights into his nature and to his background and to his sin. In Isaiah 14, for example, he says, Oh, how you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, O son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, you said, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. Notice again, he's describing the angelic with that phrase, stars of God. And I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. And there it is. There is the, the sin of, of Lucifer described in, in detail. And then in the book of Ezekiel, it tells us and it helps us to see that Lucifer or Satan is behind the nations, the powers that are riding over the nations. The influence of the satanic influence must not be discounted. And it gives us this picture all the way back in Ezekiel 28 when it comes to the king of Tyre. This is a king on the coast, a city, powerful city just north of Israel. Ezekiel 28, again, the word of the Lord came to me, to Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him this. You say, thus says the Lord God, you have the seal of perfection. Notice how he then describes uh, him as even co combining with the description of Satan. You have the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. And on the day you were created, they were prepared, these precious stones. You were the anointed cherub who covers. And I placed you there. Now that word cherub is, a, is a, an angel. Uh, unfortunately, we've kind of made the, the idea of cherub uh, wrongful in our in our minds because of the artsy stuff that you often see. You go to various stores and the cherubs are these little fat angels with little wings. And you know what I'm saying? It's like you look at them and you say, well, how can you even fly? You got little wings and you're so fat. And you say, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, no, no, that is not the right picture to have because he's like this powerful, right? He's this powerful picture. And he said, you are that anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. What, a, what an interesting thing. You were blameless in your ways before the days you were created, that is, until unrighteousness was found in you. He's giving us this backdrop. Now it tells us then that after Lucifer's sin, that there was this rebellion in heaven, this war in heaven, a third of the angels joined him in this angelic war, thrown to the earth to deceive the nations. It's interesting to note, by the way, that uh, there are other religions with a different perspective or take on the history of Lucifer. And of note would be a Mormonism that teaches that actually Jesus and Lucifer were brothers. Again, this is their doctrine. Uh, they were actually brothers, the result of being born from sexual relations between God and his many wives in heaven and uh, each were to present a plan. Uh, Lucifer's plan was that man would have no free will. God rejected it. And so uh, Lucifer, being rejected and angry about that, rebelled and thus uh, he fell. And so, again, that's just an interesting perspective of other religions. But the Bible gives us the history of Lucifer here as well as his future. And he tells us in regards to his future, he has seven heads and ten horns. Now he's looking here into the prophetic, into the, the latter days, because the Antichrist is described in the exact same description, seven heads, 10 horns. Revelation 17, the same picture is given. Seven heads or seven mountains or seven kingdoms, five have fallen. That would be uh, Assyria, Babylon, Mede, Persia, uh, and Greece. One is, currently in that day would be Rome, and one will be. That would be the Antichrist who will arise, the, the, the ten horns uh, alert us to that he will arise from a ten nation alliance coming out of the nations of the former Roman Empire and that he is now giving us what Jesus called the signs of the times that we might be watchful so that we would be ready, be alert, watch for these things, you know that the time is near. And so he then will destroy three of those kings or kingdoms 
and thus the seven heads with the ten horns. Now, many therefore have looked to see and to try to discern from which city he will come. Like, is there a city that is built on seven hills? And interestingly of note, of course, Rome is a city built on seven hills. When you go to Rome, much is made of the fact that it's built on seven hills. But Rome is not the only city. There are other cities built on seven hills. Jerusalem should also be understood in that story. It is also famously built on seven hills. But also so is Moscow. Moscow is a tremendous view. I've been to Moscow, and when you look out over the, uh, I remember getting up at the break of dawn and looking out over the city, and on each of these hills, uh, hills is a majestic, uh, like orthodox uh, cathedral. It's like amazing view. But there are other cities that are built on seven hills, so as to not to make too much of it, so is Seattle. There you go. <laughs> but he's also telling us that, that, in regards to spiritual warfare, his desire is to destroy Israel. The intent of the enemy, his, he longs to destroy Israel. Notice, in verse 4, he tells us that the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour the child. Now, in the story of Christmas, we're just around the corner of Christmas, one of the parts of that story is that these, these wise men that come from the east, they come to Jerusalem and they ask King Herod, where is he who is born king of the Jews? Now when King Herod hears them say this, he's greatly alarmed. And so he turns to the religious leaders and asks them, from whence will come the king who is born king of the Jews? And it says that they, they answered, actually they had to look it up, they didn't know. They looked it up and came back and said, the king of the Jews will be born in Bethlehem. So then, as we know the story, he, he set forth an edict <clears throat> to destroy all of the baby boys uh, from two years and younger in the city of Bethlehem. And thus his attempt to devour the son. Interesting, as we're seeing this perspective. But as we also know, of course, the angel alerted Joseph, alarmed him to get up and to flee to Egypt until Herod the Great had died. And thus, out of Egypt, I called my son. Interestingly, he came then and lived in, and grew up in Nazareth. But notice also verse 13 in Revelation 12. When the dragon saw <clears throat> that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who had given birth to the male child. That explains a lot of what has happened in world history. You go back through world history and you can see that theme unfold in many, many different ways. Uh, you go all the way back to Egypt and their oppression over e uh, Israel those 400 years and their attempt later to destroy them. And then you can roll forward to Persia under the influence of Haman and the edict that went forth to destroy every living Jew. But God intervened as we know the story. And then you have to roll to more modern times with Hitler and World War II and the Holocaust. Was that not the intent of Hitler to destroy Jews everywhere he could find them? And if he had succeeded in becoming victorious and actually taking Europe, he would have then continued through the world as we know his intent to destroy Jews everywhere he could find them. And you see what's behind that. What's the influence behind that? Then you look to even more modern times in our own modern day. Many of the Arab nations and all of fundamentalist Islam has as their stated purpose to destroy Israel, to push them into the sea. You see what's behind it, the spiritual nature that's behind such things. Here in the scriptures, interestingly, Jew, Israeli leaders today would say that the, the answer to peace in the Middle East is to have a two-state solution. This is Jewish leaders would say. We believe the best answer is to have a Palestinian state and a Jewish state. But it's a non-starter. Because part of that then would be, Jews would say, well, we will recognize Palestine if Palestine will recognize Israel. And then the Palestinian leaders would say, absolutely no way. We will not concede on that point because, of course, their intent and purpose is to destroy Israel. How about we give recognition to them as a state? It's a non-starter. There will be no peace in the Middle East until the Antichrist comes. Because now we look to the future. 
In the latter days, the Antichrist arises out of this ten-nation alliance, and he will rule with that alliance. He will rule the world, and he will make a covenant of peace between Israel and the nations. And many foresee that part of that covenant will be the allowance of the rebuilding of the temple. In fact, when we were in Israel, we went as a group to the Temple Institute. This is an organization that is building and preparing the implements and the tools needed for the third temple to be built again. They anticipate it. Like they're like preparing. And these, as the scripture says, according to all the descriptions of the scripture, they're making these things ready for and anticipating the rebuilding of the temple. But what we also understand from the prophecy of scripture is that three and a half years after this covenant of peace, the Antichrist betrays that covenant against Israel and he takes the temple back. And he then, uh, of all the offensive things he could do, he does what Jesus refers to, quoting from the, uh, from the prophecies of Daniel, the abomination of desolation. He sets himself up in the holy of holy places to be honored and to be worshipped there. And as you can just respond, Israel, re re Israel responds with force and a hall breaks loose. What, wasn't that the point? To antagonize Israel into a war? And so thus you see the intent all through the history of the world is to destroy Israel. And the latter days is such as well. And then you look through. At times it seems that Israel's existence was holding by a thread. But you also see the intervention of God. You know, do you remember back May 14th, 1948, when David Ben-Gurion uh, declared the nation of Israel to be reestablished as a nation. May 14th, 1948. The moment he did so, six Arab nations declared war instantly. Six Arab nations with well-established armies and air force attacked the newly reborn Israel with four planes in their air force and no one to fly them and not an army to speak of. And yet, Israel was victorious. How amazing. And then you continue forth, one war after the other. 1967 war. Absolutely, six-day war. Amazing. The retaking of Jerusalem. The liberating of the Western Wall. The Golan Heights taken again. 1973 Yom Kippur War, however, was different. By all accounts, Israel was going to be destroyed. They were suffering terrible losses. And in fact, Golda Meir called the Secretary of the State of the United States and let him know, that was Henry Kissinger, that their backs were against the wall. By all appearances, they were going to be defeated. And that they had no choice but to use their nuclear arms. Henry Kissinger went into to, to President Nixon and reported these things, who responded by saying, then send them everything we've got to support them. Send them everything we can to support them. And thus began the greatest airlift of armament to supply war that the world has ever seen. Cargo planes were landing every 20 seconds. And one time, the Secretary of State was reading a list of things that the Israel nation had requested. Uh, President Nixon interrupted him and said, double it. At one point, the secretaries were squabbling over which planes to send him. The president interrupted them. Stop the squabbling and send them everything that flies. He was intent on helping Israel, which is interesting because he was in battle in his own battle, Watergate. In fact, he later said, I had nothing to lose. In fact, Russia was, was tremendously supplying the other side, the Arab nations, and Russia, when they saw what the United States was doing, was threatening to join the war. To which Richard Nixon said, you do that and we will respond with nuclear war. And they backed down. Interesting, Golda Meir says later, if it was not for President Nixon, the nation of Israel would not have survived. Don't you find that an interesting factoid? Why does Satan desire to destroy Israel? Because it's from her 
who will come, the one who will rule the world, the nation. He will set forth. Jesus Christ will return in the latter days. He will set foot on the Mount of Olives. He will come into Jerusalem through the western uh, gate, and he will rule the world from Jerusalem, and the nations will come into him. We've, uh, we know this is the prophecy of Scripture that Isaiah gave to us all the way back in Isaiah 9. A child will be born to us. We love reading this every Christmas. A son will be given to us. And the government will rest on his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. And it is the zeal of the Lord of hosts that will accomplish this. I don't know about you, but I love that phrase, the zeal of the Lord of hosts who will make this to be. So Revelation 12, he's giving us this, this nature of spiritual battle, but it's also personal in the sense that he wants us to beware of the schemes of the enemy. Jesus said, your enemy, the devil, comes seeking to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus said, but I have come that you would have life, and have it abundantly. What a completely different desire. What a completely different intent. You see the nature of spiritual warfare between them. And it tells us that the, the Satan, his desire is to deceive the nations. And that, that nature of deception is seen in many things, but one of them has to be seen as, quote, the lie. Religious nature of deception, the lie, is found in many different religions. For example, many were caught up in the cultural change that happened uh, in the United States and in the Western world in the 1960s, the cultural revolution that were really in many ways led by the Beatles. The Beatles who brought Eastern religions into the mainstream of American culture. Now you might want to know how I, how I know these things. I read about them in history books. But the Beatles were a very important part of that cultural shift and Eastern religions was part of what they brought in. And the idea, the mantra you might say of Eastern religion is that everyone is a God, they just are not aware of it and it is their desire to open up your awareness to your Godness. That is, quote, the lie. And it's found in other religions as well. Mormon doctrine states that, uh, that uh, you can become a God of your own world. And so it's interesting because in 1 John chapter 5, he says, the one who does not believe God has made him to be a liar. I think John's just kind of hot when he writes that. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. It is as simple and straightforward and as powerful as that. The whole purpose of God is through His Son. Because God loved the world. God loved the world so much that He gave His only begotten Son. That whoever would believe in Him would not perish, but have eternal and everlasting life. So he's giving us the nature of this so that we might be aware of the schemes. And the intent of his enemy is completely the opposite. And for he says, he tells us that our enemy, the devil, is the accuser of the brethren. So he gets personal. Now it gets personal here. Verse 10, the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. You know, Satan doesn't even have to lie about us to be the accuser of the brethren because everybody has enough sin in his life that all he's got to do is bring up your past. Everybody's got enough sin. No need for a show of hands on this one. Everyone has got enough sin in their life that all he's got to do is bring up your past and he is the accuser of the brethren. But see, here's the thing. Many people are defeated by being constantly reminded of the failures of their past. But the problem is that the failures of your past is only part of your story. It's only part of your story. The other part of the story is the gospel of Jesus Christ 
that makes us born again into newness of life. Because in fact, your sin, your past failures have been paid in full by the blood of Jesus Christ. If your sin has been paid in full by the blood of Jesus Christ, then who can condemn you? You want to hear a powerful scripture? Romans chapter 8, verses 33 to 35. I mean, take hold of these verses and write them on your heart. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? You tell me. He says, who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Well, then who is the one who's going to condemn Christ Jesus is the one who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God and who is interceding for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? He says later, nothing can separate us from the love of God which is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Know this. Take hold of this. Because your enemy... Though he is the accuser of the brethren, he is a defeated foe. He, hell is reserved for Satan and those who follow after him. It says the, the saints overcame the serpent of old by the blood of the lamb. What a great word is that. It's covered by the blood. But the, he, he says they also overcame by the word of their testimony. Now that's powerful. The word of their testimony. Yeah. That's your story. It's powerful. Your story is powerful. Because your story includes your past failure and the forgiveness that Jesus gave when he paid for it in full. That's your testimony. That's your story. And they overcame. Because when you know the truth, when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that you pursued us with your love. And we just want to give you thanks. We give you honor and praise because our enemy is a defeated foe. And you have given for us newness of life. And you've given for us a relationship to God. When you invited us to be born again, into new life, into a relationship to God. And church this morning, isn't that the invitation that God would give to each one of us? As you're, as you're continuing to pray, if you would open your heart to Him into that relationship, it's a prayer. It's a prayer by which you would pray like this. God in heaven, I ask that you would forgive my sin. Forgive me of my sin. By the blood of Jesus Christ, I ask that you would forgive me of all my sin. And that you would receive me in, into that relationship of, of life with you. And I ask Jesus Christ into my heart as Lord and Savior. For I, I want to have that relationship that you're inviting me to have. And church, as we're praying this morning, if you prayed that prayer with me this morning, can, would you just... Would you just raise your hand that I can just say yes and amen and God bless you. Amen, amen, and amen. Anyone else? God bless you. In the front and the side and the middle. Anyone else? God bless you. Spirit, all the way in the back. God bless you too. Anyone else? There in the middle. God bless you. God bless you. Father, you ignite our hearts. You bring life. You bring love. We are so thankful for that. We give you honor and praise. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, can we give the Lord praise? Amen. Amen.